Hey there, welcome back to the channel, everyone. Uh, I am honored to sit down with Marcos Cor Corvicus. Corvicus, uh -huh. am I pronouncing Cor that correctly? Corvicus, Corvicus. So yeah. Marcos is uh, currently in Kuala Lumpur, which is in Malaysia. It's their capital city. Exactly. And I'm coming from my home base here in Koh Samui in Thailand. We've been connected on LinkedIn for at least a year now. Isn't that right? Yeah, many months. <laughs> Marcos is a, a career coach. He's also a CV and LinkedIn trainer. So he helps you, you know, uh, build a, a winning resume and cover letter when you're applying for jobs. And he also helps you optimize your LinkedIn profile uh, so that it can get, you know, get found by recruiters and hiring managers. Tell me a little bit more about your background and what inspired you to become a digital nomad in the first place. Yeah, sure. So... I was working for around uh, 10 something years as an employee for private companies. And I also have a small experience in working for an NGO. And uh, especially for the private companies, something was not feeling right for me. I didn't have my freedom uh, to work from anywhere, anytime I liked. And, uh, you know, all these things that uh, they nomads, uh, most digital nomads uh, do. And that's the reason. Uh -huh. So my number one value is freedom. And I was not feeling that uh, by working for somebody for somebody else. And this is how I decided to start my own business in 2018. Uh, I also built my own team. And uh, everything uh, is ev everything that we do is online. So we help uh, job seekers land the job they like in uh, many countries with uh, CV writing, cover letters, job interview, uh, job search strategies, LinkedIn. And I also help uh, people discover their Ikigai. So Ikigai is a Japanese concept that means uh, life purpose. And uh, it can be personal. It is, can be something that we do voluntarily, for example. can be professional, mm -hmm. could be our job can be more than one, and it can change in the future. So I'm helping people find their Ikigai. And uh, I mostly focus uh, for people that they want to become like us. I focus for people on people that they want to find their ideal remote Ikigai job uh, so they can become digital nomads and work from anywhere. Okay. We were talking a little bit about this offline before we started the interview, and I think that is a, a really great idea to kind of combine all of these three things into one. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but essentially, a key guy is your reason for being, right? Is your 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 passion exactly your purpose in life? So it, that is able you able to combine that concept with um, finding a remote job that you're not only good at, but something that the world needs and you can be rewarded for. So exactly. So the Ikigai has uh, four elements. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. So it is something that you are good at, you love it, the world needs, and you can be rewarded for it. So if if it has these four elements, it is like your professional Ikigai. And as I okay. said, it can be more than one. Maybe some people they have two or three, and maybe they are different, not the same uh, industry, for example. And mm -hmm, then you mm -hmm. choose which one is better for you. So. It's good to find a remote job. It's good to find a remote job to work from anywhere. But if it is your icky guy, even better, right? <laughs> how how often do you travel throughout the year, and how many countries have you been to? On LinkedIn, it says you've been to thirty four countries, which is pretty yeah. impressive. So yeah, tell me more is, about uh, that. This is updated. Uh, yeah, I traveled to thirty four countries, uh, most of them in Europe. Uh, there were around twenty eight countries in Europe and the rest in the Southeast Asia. And I keep traveling. I love traveling. I usually stay, huh? I usually stay for around one to two months uh, per country. Sometimes I go back. There are countries that I have been uh, six times, for example. Uh, sometimes I just go out of curiosity, like in Cambodia, to explore how is it, uh, mm -hmm. how is it there, how is the culture and uh, everything. Uh, other times I go for trainings, like in the Netherlands. I have been six times in the Netherlands for trainings, for uh, wow. personal development and uh, coaching trainings. Huh? Yeah, other times for work uh, or with friends, you know, different reasons every time. 
I've been telling myself I want to go to the Netherlands for quite some time, but I just haven't made it over there yet. I've actually never been to Europe, believe it or not. Wow. <laughs> I, I One time I had to fly from Buenos Aires, which is in Argentina, yeah. all the way over to London across the pond uh, just to get back to the U.S., which uh, is see. the most haphazard flight I've ever been on. But uh <laughs> didn't really leave the airport, so it <laughs> doesn't count. Yeah. So if you need any tips about yeah. Europe, I can, uh, I can say some. <laughs> uh, I know right now you're in Kuala Lumpur. Um, how, how, how do you like Malaysia? So I'm here just a few days, maybe this mm -hmm. is my fifth uh, day, actually. And because I also work, uh, I haven't managed to go around, uh, but I did my research with also some friends and uh, Google and everything. So I found some cool. places that I really like to visit. And uh, my plan is for the next days to visit a few places. Uh, Kuala Lumpur uh, looks like New York, uh, let's say. Mm -hmm. It's full, full of skyscrapers and uh, it's a modern city with technology and everything. Yeah, let's see, They're with towers and everything. And uh, my plan is to go to Penang, to the island and uh, some other places. So my favorite country so far, I would say, is Thailand. <laughs> uh, yeah, because, same here. That's why I live here. Yeah, I, I really years. like I like the summer weather. That's why I left Europe during the winter. <laughs> uh -huh. so I, I, I'm yeah, traveling in Southeast Asia since the 1st of September. So uh, my favorite country is Thailand. Uh, I love uh, <laughs> the islands like uh, Copagan, uh, Kotao especially for scuba diving in Kotao, uh, Koh Samui also, and uh, some other places like Chiang Mai and Pai. And uh, yeah, like many places in Thailand. I love it. And, yeah, uh, and that's I, actually where we, we got a chance to meet when you were visiting in Koh Samui for, what was it, about a few weeks or a month? Yeah, and... actually, I was in Samui for three weeks. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> three weeks. yeah. And we, we were able to sit down at a, a nice, where the place you were staying in, Chuang, yes. got a, had a nice sit down and chat, good food. So it was good to, you know, finally meet because we've been connected for quite some time on LinkedIn and, and uh, you just happened to be in Samui. So yeah, so, that was, that was very nice. Time. Actually, I got the inspiration from you to travel to Samui. I didn't know about Samui. Uh-huh. Oh, you didn't even know about it before. No. I, I have Forest never heard about Samui. Yeah, I have never heard mm -hmm. about it before. So I heard about it uh, from you, actually, and I decided to to explore Samui. I've traveled all over Thailand, and I just kept coming back to Samui and decided, why not just make this my home base? And uh, yeah, yeah. So it's idea. a beautiful place. Good but idea. so just to continue, so how do you help people find remote jobs so that they can work from anywhere and become a Mm. location independent digital nomad yeah that's a good question uh, we are uh, going through a process with uh, seven coaching sessions mm -hmm. they are around one hour one hour and a half per session and we usually do around eight activities with a lot of questions uh, tasks about uh, self-knowledge and awareness uh, tasks about uh, values, working principles, professional interests, uh, personal goals, professional goals, uh, short analysis, like what are our strengths, our weaknesses, what are the opportunities out there. So we do a lot of things to discover at least one ikigai, at least one personal ikigai and at least one professional ikigai. This is how we do it. So we need around yes. one month, one month and a half to complete the process and have the ikigai. And then it's up to each person how to go there. I give a strategy with the next steps, how to go there. And it's up to each person how much time they will invest or energy or money if needed for trainings or whatever to get the knowledge and the skills to do the Ikigai the fastest uh, possible. Uh -huh. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> so how... how um... I know a lot of people that are interested in becoming a digital nomad have certain mental blocks, mm -hmm. right? Where they, they feel it's not possible for one reason or another. I've noticed through my own communities that, I, that I'm building on LinkedIn and Facebook, um, one of the most common ones is just not having the financial wherewithal or the financial um, 
budget to yeah, travel full time. And obviously having a, a fully remote job will kind of take uh, that, that anxiety away so that they can travel and work from anywhere, right? So this is really important. And also you need that remote job in order to get a digital nomad visa in a lot of these countries. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, we also work on that during our sessions uh, because yeah, many people don't know how it works and how they believe that these digital nomads are very uh, rich people or whatever, for example. Here, uh, I can show you, I'm uh, in a, I'm in a four-star hotel. This is a beautiful yeah. room with a view to the Wow, city. that's a quite a nice view from it's, there, it's, though. It's a, it's a nice uh, hotel, nice room. And uh -huh. I, pay for, I pay for that, I'm on the 20th floor. I pay for that uh, 30 euros per night. 30 euros wow. per night, it's like $30 per night. It has a wow. an, an amazing swimming pool on the 47th floor. A gym uh -huh. on the 48th floor with a view, a free co working space, very good internet. Like, they have a co working space there too? Yeah, and it is free. In and the it hotel. has a view to the city. Yeah, co working space on the oh. 46th floor, swimming pool and jacuzzi 47th and gym 48th floor, everything for free, included in this price. Amazing. So it's, not, it's not that expensive as many people think. And there are mm -hmm. other places uh, like Bali and many places in uh, Thailand or uh, other countries. Also in Europe, uh, Bulgaria, Croatia, and many other countries, that uh, they are very affordable for most people. Huh. And Even though, though, you know, tons and tons of tourists are flocking to Bali now, you can still find affordable accommodation yeah. over there. Like I was Compared living, to places like the States, where it's exactly. outrageously expensive. Exactly. Like I was living yeah. in Ubud, in Bali, in the jungle, uh, in the city center of Ubud. I could go everywhere by walking. And I was paying six euros per night for a double bedroom. I mean, am I hearing that right? Did you say six euros per night? Six. Six euros per night. Not a hostel. It was a private it, room with a bathroom <laughs> and double bed. Six euros per night. Is this during COVID times or recently after the pandemic? That was uh, last, uh, last uh, September, actually. September, October okay. 2022. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. So, so that just goes to show the cost of living and the quality of life in these places is pretty mind blowing. Yeah. So, so as a digital nomad, you can take advantage of the geographic uh, arbitrage. That means mm -hmm. that yep. uh, you get some money from your clients, right? But you can travel to places that they are more affordable for you. Like here in Kuala Lumpur, I have been to restaurants with amazing uh, meals for lunch and dinner for two euros. Two dollars per meal. Unbelievable. It cooked food, like very nice food, not uh, you know. <laughs> like That's even nice cheaper food. than over here in Samui. It's a kind of a touristy island, right? So yeah, it is even cheaper um, than Samui. And uh, it's, I, I mean, the city center. I mean, Kuala Lumpur. If, if I uh -huh. go to other places around Malaysia, it would be even cheaper, <laughs> right? Like in, in Cambodia, for example, I was uh, living in Siem Reap, and uh, I could find restaurants for. They had so many dishes for $1. $1. Wow. So, so many meals in the restaurants. In CMB, That's just, which is the second say that uh, to somebody back in, you know, in America <laughs> and they'll be blown away, right? It's, so, it's so you can even save money. If you, if you start your life as a digital nomad, even if uh -huh. you begin, you get uh, just, uh, I don't know, maybe $500 per month, you can still make it if you go to countries like that. Of course. Yeah, I, I recently did an interview on retired working for you. Maybe you saw it. Uh, it's just about the cost of living in Samui. And I was breaking down my budget line by line. And it worked out to be about $1,000 per month to live on this, you know, paradise island, basically, compared to five, six times more in, in the U.S., in the city where I was living for many exactly. years. So yeah, it's just a no brainer. And, and from here, you can obviously travel around Southeast Asia pretty easily it's not basically the most expensive thing would be a flight a plane ticket yeah this is the most expensive thing a, a flight ticket like from america to asia or from europe yeah this is the most expensive but all the rest mm -hmm. if you stay a long time you don't care like uh, okay if you go for one week doesn't make any sense to pay all this money right but if you go yeah. to stay for months then yeah it makes sense <laughs> 
Yeah. And if you're just traveling between country to country every few weeks, you don't really get to experience the culture. You don't get to try the, the food, meet different people. So Absolutely. it's better to, I, I prefer, honestly, well, I've been living in Thailand three years, but I think the, the slow mad style is a, a little bit better in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's rushing just to tick off the boxes. It's better for us because we can also uh, learn the culture, enjoy the place without uh, mm-hmm. working a rush and also work smoothly without, uh, you know, going around to watch everything and to work at the same time and to also meet some people who make some friends. And uh, it's also better for the environment. Like, you know, that many people, yeah, they, are, uh, they are cursing digital nomads because they have a lot of flights and it's not good for the environment. So if you are a slow it's also better for the environment. So we are avoiding all this uh, cursing from other people, right? And you said you're going down to Penang pretty soon. Is that right? Uh, in the next few days? Yeah. In uh, two weeks, I will go to Penang. Uh, there is a retreat uh, from uh, Mind Valley members, uh, students. Uh, Mind okay. Valley is a global educational platform that I really like, uh, full of trainings online and offline. And we'll have a retreat for uh, three days. We'll stay a few more days more. But these three days, we will be around 20 people together doing workshops, uh, workshops, uh, skill sharing. Uh, it will be very nice, very nice experience. And of course, explore Penang. <laughs> yeah. I'm familiar with Mind Valley. I've never been to one of their conferences before, but it uh, seems like they're doing good work. Yeah, I, I love it. I have met amazing people through Mind Valley. I was in Estonia last uh, year for, three, for one month. There is an offline uh-huh. event for three weeks. I plan to go again this year. And there were 1,500 people from 70 plus countries. Yes. Well, and it's are, a melting pot. Yeah, and they are, you know, like-minded people with uh, personal growth and uh, entrepreneurship and uh, soft skills mm-hmm. and many things like that. So it's very interesting. You meet a lot of people and there are a lot of sure. interesting workshops and talks. Yeah, it's very nice. That's really one like thing it. I miss. I haven't been to a you know, conference for a few years now. I haven't really, like, I need to get back into the game again, you know. Yeah. Um, but now in Samui, they're actually organizing digital nomad meetups. So I went to one last weekend where they're just, they've created like a WhatsApp group and they're bringing together Amazing. digital nomads on the island. So that's a good way at least to to meet other like-minded people. Yeah, that's very nice. Very good idea. <laughs> Better than nothing. <laughs> yeah, very good idea. So another question I have you is how, obviously you're familiar with ChatGPT, yeah. right? It's, it's how many... 100 million or 10 million customers in the first few weeks or a month. Exactly. And now everybody's talking about it. It's taken over. It's going to ultimately going to replace entire industries, right? So how yeah, do you so- see that evolving over the next few years? And do we need to be worried about it? Uh, how it, people are saying it's going to replace all the jobs. So yeah, top CPT and other- and white color. Yeah, ChatGPT and other similar tools and uh, in general, artificial intelligence and robots are here. Uh, uh-huh. and some of them are here a long time ago, like even a decade ago. And <laughs> they are already replacing some jobs, right? Like uh, I, ha- maybe I guess that also uh, you by traveling in Southeast Asia or other countries uh, and other digital uh-huh. nomads, you have seen a lot of robots. Like in Estonia, there are robots that they deliver uh, food packages. And I think you can you can see robots on the streets going around, uh, or in uh, the airports and uh, malls and uh, many other things. There are robots that they are cleaning the space, or they are doing customer support, or there are robots in uh, there are restaurants and hotels in Japan, in Korea that uh, they only have robots, no humans. Uh, or barista robots like many and hotel other check-ins too i was watching a video about in south korea where they have a robot checking you into the hotel yeah, exactly so is... there, are, there are even robots uh, in sweden that they do job interviews and they decide uh, which candidates will uh, go to the second uh, phase and uh, have an interview with an actual recruiter so this is there, different from the applicant tracking system right it's something else yeah yeah this is a robot it is a robot a natural okay. robot uh, can hmm. be offline one-to-one with a robot or or uh, online with an application and the robot evaluates the candidates and decide 
who is better to go for a second interview with the human resources department. This already happening since 2019. Uh, wow. actual this is the first I'm hearing about it. Yeah, it's called the Ten Guy from Full Hat Robotics in Sweden. And uh, I guess mm-hmm. maybe there are now more companies uh, for that. I'm not sure if there are more. So, yeah, uh, artificial intelligence is here. It is already replacing some jobs. I believe that uh, we should be aware about it. And uh, yeah. there are many professions that I believe they will be replaced if the professionals will not. Uh, don't know how to use AI for their business. Yeah, so how can we use this to our advantage, right? To, to put exactly. ourselves in the competition. Exactly. So I am a career coach. Will I use AI to improve my job or will I let AI to replace me, for example? Mm-hmm. Of the course, AI, AI cannot really replace uh, human interaction jobs, uh, but it, it can help a lot. So what does it mean? Is that the people that they learn how to use AI, they will have an advantage, right? Or you could be the one selling the pickaxes, right? You can create a, let's say, a course about how to use ChatGPT. That's something I've done myself. Yeah, that's And also a good idea. Say, the people want to learn how to use this technology, right? There you go. That's how you uh, exactly. can make, make money. Exactly. That's a good idea. Of course, there are many years to go and... Uh, as these are nomads who can have clients from all over the planet. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's not really affecting us because sure. we can uh, help yeah. people uh, from many countries, uh, different backgrounds. Many people don't know how to use technology. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's. I think it's not a big risk for these are nomads. And we can we can use ChatGPT to write entire cover letters. I've just say oh, write uh, you know write a cover letter for such and such job description. Copy paste exactly. it in the job description, and it will spit out a cover letter for you. Yeah, uh, I was ten I was thirty seconds. Yeah, I it's was telling to my I was telling to my team actually a few days ago that uh, uh, ChatGPT and other tools uh, they will uh, replace uh, some of our services like uh, cover letter writing. Like, right? so mm-hmm. if you know how to use ChatGPT, you can post a. Uh, the job description, you can uh, post your uh, resume in a word format maybe, and uh, you can ask with some specific uh, directions for the ChatGPT to write a cover letter for you. And it will probably be in a very good level. Okay? Absolutely. So this is one of our services uh, as career coach that will be replaced from artificial intelligence. It is out. this something that you're integrating into your career coaching services? Teaching people how to do these, how to use ChatGPT and that sort of thing? Uh, I haven't done it yet, uh, but I, I plan to do it. I plan to do it because it is uh, like inevitable. Like uh, it makes sense that uh, ChatGPT and other similar tools will replace some services, right? They can uh-huh. replace the copywriters too. They're going to be out of jobs. Yeah. Pretty they, soon. They, they cannot replace the coaching sessions that I'm doing about finding your icky guy. They cannot replace that, but they can oh. replace a cover letter writing. It may be also resume writing. Could be very possible to make it in a very good level, right? Replace them and then also increase time efficiency. So instead yeah. of using all your brain power to come up with a cover letter, just ask ChatGPT to do it for you. And yeah. I've made uh, video tutorials about this on my YouTube channel as well, which you can also check out. That, that's amazing. Also, I want to say here that there are some other AI tools that they can help our job, right? Like for me, There is an a, a, a new AI tool that it can help with uh, they can help career coaches with job interview simulation, like mm. to to test a candidate with a you know a demo job interview by using this AI tool for better results. This is an AI ah. tool that it was built for career coaches to help our job for job interview services. And so, what is that AI tool called? It's called the uh, Yodli. Yudli, like something like that. Yudli. Yudli. Uh, so Yudli is made for career courses to improve the job interview services, for example. Right? Ah. So there are so some this AI helps tools. you with the job interview itself, like it a mock uh, interview? It gives suggestions, it records everything, it takes notes, uh, it gives ratings, evaluation for the candidate, and many other things. Like it's, it's very nice. Wow. Uh, I think they have cool. a lot of uh, 
time to test it because uh, the truth is that from job seekers, the most uh, requested service from us is either career coaching to change the job and find their Ikigai or uh, CV writing uh, service and LinkedIn training. So I don't have a lot of requests about job interview, uh, like demo job interviews to test, but it's something that I would like to try in the future. I want to say here that, yeah, there are some AI tools that they can boost our job. So imagine a career coach like me having a tools like that and other coaches that they don't have these AI tools. So this mm. is like an advantage for me that I know how to use AI. Right? So it's up to, up to us if we will use AI to improve our services or let AI take our job, right? <laughs> yeah, you can either get with the program or be left behind, right? Exactly. Uh, and there's actually a website called there's an AI for that. Dot com. I don't know if you're familiar with this one, but it has just hundreds and hundreds of different AI tools uh, for yeah. pretty much any topic that you're you're interested in. Yeah, that's, there uh, are so pretty, many already. Amazing. Yeah, <laughs> so many. And another question I have is, I, I know you're a wealth of experience on all things, you know, career coaching, remote jobs, that sort of thing. So I want to ask you, uh, what? why do you think that so many tech companies, especially in the U.S., Facebook, Google, Amazon, um, what else? Many, many tech companies. They're hiring off, they're firing tens of thousands of employees. Uh, why do you think that is? What's a is it just because they were hiring really, really fast during the pandemic and it wasn't sustainable? Um, give me some insights in, into that. I'd be curious. I'm sure my viewers would as well. Yeah, so about that, yeah, I was also curious because they were firing many people. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't done a, a deep research about this. Uh, I have some assumptions. I have some assumptions. Uh, one assumption is that uh, maybe they are replacing some people uh, with tools, like uh, artificial intelligence tools. So AI can uh, replace some of these jobs. This is one idea that I had. Uh, another idea is that Maybe they were firing people uh, that they had uh, very high salaries. They were uh, like uh, on-site employees, and they are firing on-site employees, maybe to hire remote employees uh, with uh, more affordable salaries. That's an assumption. Yeah, like, that's a possibility sure as well. It. But mm -hmm. it makes sense. Like if you have an employee, if you have a company like in uh, New York, and you have employees in, in New York, you have very high salaries. But if the same job can be made from a guy like, uh, I don't know, in India or uh, other countries remotely, uh, you have way less uh, salary most of the time. Cheaper labor. And it, why not outsource it yeah. to the Philippines or India? Yeah, so a lot of outsourcing. Yeah. I, I also do this by myself, right? I used to do this by myself. Like uh, now I want to upgrade some of my services and... Uh, I'm looking for a collaboration with a team in Philippines, in the Philippines, because uh -huh. oh, yeah. they are... Yeah, there's a lot of virtual assistants over there. You could be paying them five bucks an hour, which is a decent exactly. salary in their exactly. country. They are, you, they are yeah. a very in a very good level. They speak English fluently, and they are uh -huh. way more affordable than uh, hiring people from uh, other countries like in Europe or America. So it makes sense. Of uh, course. So I, I assume that that's why maybe they are firing so many people because they mm -hmm. want to, to replace some of them with remote workers or maybe they are replaced from AI tools. That's my assumption. Yeah, uh, Microsoft has invested $10 billion into ChatGPT, right? And they built it into their Bing search engine now. Yeah. So it's just integrated right into search and Google's trying to compete as well with this thing called Bard, Bard AI. So now yeah. it's like an AI yeah. war. They're <laughs> it is seeing it is who can, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. But we still need people like you, obviously. Like, the, the robots aren't going to take your job anytime soon. Let's hope, let's hope not. Actually, and, uh, well, the research, research, we always need a human face, yeah. The research, research uh, or actually, there are, there are many, many more that they say mm -hmm. that uh, for every job that the AI will replace, it will create two more. Ah, okay. So actually, the jobs are increasing in, mm -hmm. instead of decreasing. Uh, but they, there will be jobs that they are relevant to technology and AI, most of them. 
So maybe a job will be replaced. But the prompt next, engineering is an example. Yeah, of people yeah. that can come up with the prompts. Yeah. So so okay. Uh, AI actually is uh, offering more jobs than uh, the jobs that uh, it is taking. It's mm-hmm. up to mm-hmm. us if we will adapt to this change and uh, learn new skills and uh, follow the the trends. Exactly. It's all mindset up here. Yeah. So another question I have you is where do you see remote in the ne- remote work and hybrid in the next five years? So I believe that will be increasing uh, uh, more and more again and again. Uh, I have uh, I have done a lot of polls and I have read many more from uh, official uh, organizations and websites and companies and many things like that. And uh, it seems that most people, like the majority of the people, they like ninety percent. They want to work remotely. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. is uh, up to ninety percent, and half of them they want to work fully remotely or uh, hybrid. Yeah. Uh, and when they mean hybrid, uh, they like to interact with their colleagues or to other people in general. So hybrid could also be co-working space or uh, something else. Does it necessarily mean that they want to go to their office, to their company? Okay. So well, it's always good to have, be able to share resources with one another in person versus always using Zoom like we're doing right now or Skype yeah. or all these video conferencing tools. It's you got to be face to face at least a couple times a week. And yeah. there's actually a, a poll that said that hybrid remote work is expected to grow from 42% to 81% in 2024. Yeah. It makes sense. So it's just going to continue accelerating and gaining momentum. Um, and you can either adapt or <laughs> be left exactly. behind, right? Yeah. I believe we will uh, see many more countries offering digital nomad visas and uh, easier uh, terms and everything and requirements. Uh, we'll see more companies uh, setting uh, up uh, to hire people from other countries. Mm-hmm. Because right now, most companies, they face challenges with uh, taxes, insurance, uh, time zone, team building, data security, and other things to hire people from other countries. That's why people uh, struggle to find a remote job in another country. Because companies, most of oh, the companies, yeah. they prefer to hire people, remote workers, from their own country, not from other countries, because of for this reason. Because of the time zone difference. Like if I'm working for a U.S. company remotely living yeah. in Thailand, my hours are going to be completely flipped. Or I'll have to be up at 1 a.m. in the morning. And that's why it never made sense to me. So I've, mm. you know, I've been working really hard for years to find a job that I can do over here. And luckily, I found a company uh, that's been in business for 18 years it's called Panomatics. They make virtual tours for hotels, resorts, luxury five-star hotel resorts. Amazing. And um, my boss lives in Copangan. I'm in Samui. So yeah, no time zone constraints or anything like that. You know, living over here in paradise, it's not a remote job. I kind of have to stay in Samui, but I can travel around as well mm, that's um, good. if I want to. So it's, it's pretty nice. That's great. Um, and... Yeah, I think I think that's a, a great introduction to you, and uh, hopefully, I'm gonna start doing more of these interviews too. You're you're actually one of the first digital nomads that I'm interviewing on the channel. So, uh, thank you it's for an that. Honor. <laughs> yeah, thank absolutely. You for that. So and uh, um, so, go ahead. One one more thing that I wanted to say here is that I I read a lot of po- a lot of uh, posts. Uh, uh, from uh, digital nomad uh, groups on Facebook and LinkedIn and other things, that many people are uh, curious, like, how can I find a remote job? I don't know how to find it, right? Mm-hmm. First of all, yeah, this need... happens all the time. All the time. Like, every day I see, I read this kind of stuff. Post. So, first of yeah. all, they need to clarify what kind of job they like to do. Because remote job is not a job. It's a category of job. It's too broad. Job. Yeah. What so type of remote job? Which industry? What... Exactly. What kind of remote job? And then, do they want to work remotely from their country and travel around their country, all around the world? If they mm-hmm, want to travel mm-hmm. around the world, then the most possible scenario is to become a freelancer, to, to start their own online business, because it is easier 
to work from anywhere if you have your own business. As we sure, said before, absolutely. if you want uh, to travel around the world as an employee, it's not very easy. There are just a few companies that they allow this. So, because there are many people... They're few and far between. Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. there are many people that they are searching, searching, searching. They're like, I cannot find anything. Yeah, because companies prefer uh, local employees, not employees that they want to travel the world. Okay, so if you want to travel... And they the want world, con- a certain amount of control, too. They want you to either be in the office <laughs> or on on a call a few times a week. And yeah, even, even they want to control is, your time. Even if it is fully remotely, they don't allow uh, people to go outside of the country because of data security and ah. uh, taxes and insurance. Mm, mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. complicated for them. Uh, so the best idea, if you want to travel the world as a digital nomad, I believe it's to start your own business. Uh, this yep, yep, 100%. Is easier. It's, it's way easier, right? And you can have clients from all over the planet. Exactly. <laughs> I totally agree with that. And uh, you can also use sites like Fiverr and Upwork. The only problem with that is it's a little bit, I've noticed it's quite difficult to find clients. You have to send multiple proposals on Upwork. And then on Fiverr is kind of like bottom of the barrel. You're you're getting paid a very small amount. Yeah, I know some some people that they did that. Uh, What they did was that they were offering their services uh, uh, almost for free, like in a very Mm -hmm. small amount to start getting a lot of reviews, like five-star reviews, and when they build yeah. the session, they have a lot of reviews, then they started charging more because they already have uh, an sure. account with a lot of uh, good reviews. So like, okay, now I have a portfolio, I have testimonials, now it's ready. It's easier. To That's often money. how it starts for any business. Even for my own photography business, I had yeah. to do a lot of stuff for free in the beginning exactly. and get the reviews, testimonials, and go from there. Also, there's, there's Upwork too, where you can sell course, not Upwork, Udemy. Udemy, yeah, with courses. You can sell courses on there. And um, I have noticed it's a little tricky unless you have a lot of reviews. So you can also just mm-hmm. off it, offer it for free It's in the beginning, get the reviews and go from there. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I totally <laughs> I totally agree with you. You should should have at least a few paying clients lined up. Start your own business before you just start just throw it, throw everything out the window. And take mm-hmm. off on your digital nomad journey. Yeah. It's it's very helpful to have that cushion, financial cushion, exactly for take off. Yeah, and that's a, that's a but reminder, definitely possible. Yeah, exactly. And that's a reminder, as we said in the beginning, uh, they can start uh, by traveling in uh, more affordable countries. Uh huh. Okay, even if they have a salary of uh, three to five hundred dollars per month they can find countries that this salary, this income is enough to stay there. They okay. can use no, a site like Nomad List, exactly. and, which yeah. basically breaks it down into different categories, cost of living, you know, all, all sorts of uh, fast Wi-Fi, cultural um, things, everything yeah. you can find on Nomad List. And I think Bangkok's actually number one on the site right now. Uh, and there are many options uh, that uh, they are way more affordable than uh, Nomad List is uh, mentioning mm-hmm. or, or Numbeo, another website that is comparing the cost of living from city to city, Numbeo. Uh, there are way more affordable options. Like I said, okay, for example, in Ubud, in Bali, maybe you can find accommodation for $1,000 per night, but you can also find for $3 per night, for $5 per night. Okay. So it's up so it's not necessarily an accurate representation, <laughs> right? And on Nomad List, exactly. Bali is number two. It says average cost of living two thousand dollars a month. But you can obviously spend a lot less or a lot more. It just depends on how well you want to live, right? Exactly. Also in Samui, uh, do you want to go like to have a, a pad thai for a one dollar in a, a night market, or do you want to go to a European restaurant and pay ten dollars per meal? Precisely. It's up to you, right? Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Totally up to you. Exactly. You can be living like a king over here on three thousand dollars a month, or you can yeah. be like me, spending three hundred dollars a month. Um, yeah, exactly. Entirely, entirely up to you. Many options. There are many options. It's up to us. Yeah. Like here, I pay. I, I said three thirty dollars per night here in a four star hotel with swimming pool and gym, and co-working space, everything included. I can find <laughs> a, a hostel for five dollars per night if I want. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. 
And my friend, uh, he's a retired Canadian expat. He lived, he's bought a house over here in Samili, right? But they're taking a month long vacation to Kuala Lumpur. And he mm -hmm. found this, you know, amazing deal um, at the Traders Hotel, which is right across from the, what's the name of the, the, the towers there? Petronas Towers? Petronas Towers, yeah. They are like, and yeah, he's been sharing them. pictures from that hotel. It's just like they've got a direct line of sight to the Petronas Towers. On, and they're staying there for a full month and then coming back wow. to Samili. Yeah. So I'm a little bit jealous, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's different here. Here is it's a city, you know. You are in a tropical island, yeah, sure. a very beautiful island in Samui. This is a city. Different lifestyle. Similar to Bangkok, but I would say probably a lot, quite a bit smaller population wise, right? Or it's roughly very, the same time. It's, yeah, it's different. It's different, uh, yeah, than Bangkok. Yeah, definitely different. Uh -huh. <laughs> different experience. Cool. And is there anything else we should talk about? I think that's all the questions that I have for you. Um, but happy to explore other topics if anything comes to mind. So, yeah, I believe we cover many things. Uh, so yeah, that's fine. So if uh, somebody has any questions about uh, me, about my traveling or what I'm doing, they can connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or uh, text me on WhatsApp or Telegram. Okay, and they can ask me anything, and uh, I can I would be happy to help. Do you also have a YouTube channel where they can find you, or is it mostly LinkedIn? Where's your I don't have a YouTube and channel platform. yet. Yeah, I don't have a YouTube channel yet. Uh, maybe in the future. I was uh -huh. not uh, into, into video a lot, uh, video content. I was mostly posting uh, articles and things like that. Uh, now I start posting some videos. Uh, uh, but yeah, step by step. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. One yeah. foot in front of the other. But yeah, definitely uh, can connect with you on LinkedIn. I'll leave a link in the description below where you can find all of your uh, all of your social media Thank you. platforms. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's been great having you on the channel. Thank you and very I much, Mike. He's going to be soon. Thank you very much. Yeah, hope to, to see you soon again. <laughs> I will come back to Thailand. Uh, I hope so. Yeah. Anytime you're in Samui, <laughs> just let me know. That's we'll great. That's great. Thank you.